Now, good morning. My name is Nils Ilos Koch, and I'm one of the two vice presidents of UFRO, John Innes from UPC being the other. I do hope that you enjoyed the welcome reception yesterday evening. Now, my task this morning is not to propose a toast as I did yesterday evening. My task is to propose to you to listen very concentrated to this morning's plenary speaker, Francis Seymour. Now, why should you do so? Because Francis Seymour is going to speak about forest, climate change, and communities making progress up the learning curve. And I'm sure, I'm convinced that we all are going to make great progress up that learning curve during this plenary session. Because Francis is, in my opinion, one of the most informed and interesting speakers in the world of forest science. Francis Seymour is since 2006 the Director General of C4, the Center for International Forest Research with headquarters in Bogor, Indonesia, and with offices in Africa and Latin America. At C4, Francis had led the formulation and implementation of a new strategy. And together with the other partners in the collaborative partnership on forest, C4 has under the leadership of Francis taken the lead in arranging Forest Day 1 in Bali in Indonesia in 2007, Forest Day 2 in Potsdam, Poland in 2008, Forest Day 3 in Copenhagen, Denmark in 2009, and now coming up, Forest Day 4, which will be held on December 5, 2010 in Cancun in Mexico. This has already changed the world of forestry a lot, and it's going to change the world of forestry even more in future. So, on behalf of UFRO, I'm really very proud to be able to present to you today Francis Seymour. Please give him a welcoming hand. Thank you, Niels, for that all too kind introduction. It's certainly an honor and a pleasure to share a stage with such a distinguished moderator, and it's humbling to follow the poetry of yesterday's speaker. Let me take the opportunity to commend the EUFRO Organizing Committee and our Korean hosts for the extraordinary preparations that have gone into this Congress. It was a full year ago that I was asked if I were available to make this address, and I'm not used to planning that far in ahead. It's an honor also to be asked to speak to this audience of colleagues from forestry research organizations. But it's also a challenge because most of my speeches are to designed to bring research results to policy audiences. So today I'll reverse my usual role and share some thoughts about how what we as a, as a community of researchers and research organizations can respond to the urgent needs of forest policy it will be more like a sermon than a technical presentation. And accordingly, you'll note that I'm doing without PowerPoint. My father, a Baptist minister, preached a sermon every Sunday for more than 40 years, and he never once used PowerPoint. So I guess I can do it at least once. My topic today is forests, climate change, and communities, making progress up the learning curve. My main argument is that we stand at a critical juncture in the history of forestry research and practice. One body of knowledge on the roles of communities in forest management is just reaching maturity, just as another on the roles of forests in climate change is taking off. Picture us as a community of forestry researchers as a hardy band of mountaineers gradually gaining altitude step by step ice axes in hand, ascending the learning curve of knowledge about forests and communities, seeking enlightenment at the top. And just as we thought we were gaining glimpses of the sunlit summit, the storm of climate change has blown in, and avalanches of new research challenges have pushed us back down the slope. So as we brush ourselves off, we need to figure out where we are, and we need to survey the mountains, I mean, the learning curves, newly configured topography, 
and prepare to make a second ascent. The roadmap to my talk is as follows. First, I will irritate many of you by presenting a dramatic oversimplification of the research on forests and communities over the last few decades. Next, I will irritate others of you by presenting a dramatic oversimplification of relevant research imperatives associated with forests and climate change. And finally, I'll seek to stimulate discussion over the course of the, this week by advancing some propositions about where we as a research community need to go from here. Most people would date interests in the role of communities in forest management back to about the 1970s. I remember when I was doing research for a paper in graduate school, I read about the experience here in Korea where village forestry associations planted more than a million hectares as part of a national reforestation effort in the 70s. And some of you will recall that Forests for People was the theme of the 8th World Forestry Congress in Jakarta in 1978. And it has proven a hardy perennial. The theme of next year's International Year of the Forest is celebrating forests for people. Now, interest in community forestry came from the convergence of several different motivations from among governments, donor agencies, and public interest groups. These included a desire to address high rates of deforestation and degradation, a search for livelihood strategies that would work for the rural poor, and a commitment to more democratic and equitable ways of managing society's natural resources. Now, which of these are ends and which of these are means continue to be different for different stakeholders. By the mid-1980s, countries around the world had initiated a sizable population of community forestry projects and programs along with their associated research efforts. So as a research community, we've been climbing this learning curve for about a quarter century. And we've certainly learned a lot. We've learned just how important forests are as a source of livelihoods for rural communities. Local people in East Kalimantan identify more than 2,000 different forest species with more than 3,600 different uses, 119 of which have no known substitute. Rural populations in the Congo Basin derive as much as 80% of the protein and fat in their diets from bushmeat. Data from the Poverty and Environment Project, collected from more than 10,000 households in forest-adjacent villages, shows that on average, 25% of household income in these sites is derived from forest products. We've also learned about the many constraints faced by communities in managing forests as a source of sustainable income. There are constraints on the productivity of the resource. When non-timber forest products are harvested on a commercial scale, in the absence of regulation, they tend to be depleted. There are constraints on the ability of communities to assert rights to land and forest resources. And even when those rights are recognized by the state, defending them can prove fatal. There are constraints on market access. Many forest communities are remote and lack capital, and mechanisms such as certification can be unintentionally biased against small-scale enterprises. And communities are not homogeneous. The interests of some groups, such as women, may be different from those of others and not necessarily represented in decision making. We've also learned a lot about trade-offs. As Bill Jackson of IUCN reminded us in the CPF subplenary yesterday afternoon, the large literature on integrated conservation and development projects has chipped away at the notion that biodiversity conservation and income objectives can be simultaneously maximized at the same place at the same time. But perhaps one of the most important things we've learned is the critical role of institutions in mediating the relationship between communities and forests. It turns out that it really matters who makes and enforces the rules. And I hope Eleanor Ostrom will not mind my appropriating her recent Nobel Prize in Economics as a key indicator of progress up the learning curve. But she can speak for herself on Friday. <laughs> 